Lords of the House Tops, Thirteen Cat Tales. Calvin by Charles Dudley Warner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jadopi. Calvin by Charles Dudley Warner. Calvin is dead. His life, long to him, but short for the rest of us, was not marked by startling adventures, but his character was so uncommon, and his qualities were so worthy of imitation, that I have been asked by those who personally knew him to set down my recollections of his career. His origin and ancestry were shrouded in mystery. Even his age was a matter of pure conjecture. Although he was of the Maltese race, I have reason to suppose that he was American by birth, as he certainly was in sympathy. Calvin was given to me eight years ago by Mrs. Stowe, but she knew nothing of his age or origin. He walked into her house one day out of the great unknown, and became at once at home, as if he had been always a friend of the family. He appeared to have artistic and literary tastes, and it was as if he had inquired at the door if that was the residence of the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and upon being assured that it was, had decided to dwell there. This is, of course, fanciful, for his antecedents were wholly unknown, but in his time he could hardly have been in any household where he would not have heard Uncle Tom's Cabin talked about. When he came to Mrs. Stowe, he was as large as he ever was, and apparently as old as he ever became. Yet there was in him no appearance of age. He was in the happy maturity of all his powers, and you would rather have said in that maturity he had found the secret of perpetual youth. And it was as difficult to believe that he would ever be aged as it was to imagine that he had ever been in immature youth. There was in him a mysterious perpetuity. After some years, when Mrs. Stowe made her winter home in Florida, Calvin came to live with us. From the first moment he fell into the ways of the house and assumed a recognized position in the family. I say recognized because, after he became known, he was always inquired for by visitors, and in the letters to the other members of the family he always received a message. Although the least obtrusive of beings, his individuality always made itself felt. His personal appearance had much to do with this, for he was of royal mold and had an air of high breeding. He was large, but he had nothing of the fat grossness of the celebrated Angora family. Though powerful, he was exquisitely proportioned, and as graceful in every movement as a young leopard. When he stood up to open a door, he opened all the doors with old-fashioned latches, he was portentously tall, and when stretched on the rug before the fire, he seemed too long for this world, as indeed he was. His coat was the finest and softest I have ever seen, a shade of quiet Maltese, and from his throat downward, underneath, to the white tips of his feet, he wore the whitest and most delicate ermine, and no person was ever more fastidiously neat. In his finely formed head you saw something of his aristocratic character. The ears were small and cleanly cut. There was a tinge of pink in the nostrils. His face was handsome and the expression of his countenance exceedingly intelligent. I should call it even a sweet expression, if the term were not inconsistent with his look of alertness and sagacity. It is difficult to convey a just idea of his gaiety in connection with his dignity and gravity, which his name expressed, as we know nothing of his family. Of course it will be understood that Calvin was his Christian name. He had times of relaxation into utter playfulness, delighting in a ball of yarn, catching sportively at stray ribbons when his mistress was at her toilet, and pursuing his own tail with hilarity, for lack of anything better. He could amuse himself by the hour, and he did not care for children. Perhaps something in his past was present to his memory. He had absolutely no bad habits, and his disposition was perfect. I never saw him exactly angry, though I have seen his tail grow to an enormous size when a strange cat appeared upon his lawn. He disliked cats, evidently regarding them as feline and treacherous, and he had no association with them. Occasionally there would be heard a night concert in the shrubbery. Calvin would ask to have the door opened, and then you would hear a rush and a <sighs> and the concert would explode. 
and Calvin would quietly come in and resume his seat on the hearth. There was no trace of anger in his manner, but he wouldn't have any of that about the house. He had the rare virtue of magnanimity. Although he had fixed notions about his own rights and extraordinary persistency in getting them, he never showed temper at a repulse. He simply and firmly persisted till he had what he wanted. His diet was one point. His idea was that of the scholars about dictionaries, to get the best. He knew as well as any one what was in the house, and would refuse beef if turkey was to be had. And if there were oysters, he would wait over the turkey to see if the oysters would not be forthcoming. And yet he was not a gross gourmand. He would eat bread if he saw me eating it, and thought he was not being imposed on. His habits of feeding also were refined. He never used a knife and he would put up his hand and draw the fork down to his mouth as gracefully as a grown person. Unless necessity compelled, he would not eat in the kitchen, but insisted upon his meals in the dining-room, and would wait patiently unless a stranger were present, and then he was sure to importune the visitor, hoping that the latter was ignorant of the rule of the house, and would give him something. They used to say that he preferred as his tablecloth on the floor a certain well-known church journal, but this was said by an Episcopalian. So far as I know, he had no religious prejudices, except that he did not like the association with Romanists. He tolerated the servants, because they belonged to the house, and would sometimes linger by the kitchen stove. But the moment visitors came in, he arose, opened the door, and marched into the drawing-room. Yet he enjoyed the company of his equals, and never withdrew, no matter how many callers, whom he recognized of his society, might come into the drawing-room. Calvin was fond of company, but he wanted to choose it, and I have no doubt that he was an aristocratic fastidiousness rather than one of faith. It is so with most people. The intelligence of Calvin was something phenomenal in his rank of life. He established a method of communicating his wants and even some of his sentiments, and he could help himself in many things. There was a furnace register in a retired room where he used to go when he wished to be alone, that he always opened when he desired more heat, but never shut it any more than he shut the door after himself, but could do almost everything but speak. And you would declare sometimes that you could see a pathetic longing to do that in his intelligent face. I have no desire to overdraw his qualities, but if there was one thing in him more noticeable than another, it was his fondness for nature. He could content himself for hours at a low window, looking into the ravine and at the great trees, noting the smallest stir there. He delighted, above all things, to accompany me walking about the garden, hearing the birds, getting the smell of the fresh earth, and rejoicing in the sunshine. He followed me and gambled like a dog, rolling over on the turf and exhibiting his delight in a hundred ways. If I worked, he sat and watched me, or looked off over the bank, and kept his ear open to the twitter in the cherry-trees. When it stormed, he was sure to sit at the window, keenly watching the rain or the snow, glancing up and down at its falling. And a winter tempest always delighted him. I think he was genuinely fond of birds, but so far as I know, he usually confined himself to one a day. He never killed, as some sportsmen do, for the sake of killing, but only as civilized people do. From necessity. He was intimate with the flying squirrels who dwell in the chestnut trees, too intimate, for almost every day in the summer he would bring in one, until he nearly discouraged them. He was, indeed, a superb hunter, and would have been a devastating one if his bump of destructiveness had not been offset by a bump of moderation. There was very little of the brutality of the lower animals about him. I don't think he enjoyed rats for themselves, but he knew his business, and for the first few months of his residence with us he waged an awful campaign against the horde, and after that his simple presence was sufficient to deter them from coming on the premises. Mice amused him, but he usually considered them too small game to be taken seriously. I have seen him play for an hour with a mouse, and then let him go with a royal condescension. In this whole matter of getting a living, Calvin was a great contrast to the rapacity of the age in which he lived. I hesitate a little to speak of his capacity for friendship and the affectionateness of his nature, for I know from his own reserve that he would not care to have it much talked about. We understood each other perfectly, 
but we never made any fuss about it. When I spoke his name and snapped my fingers, he came to me. When I returned home at night, he was pretty sure to be waiting for me near the gate, and would rise and saunter along the walk, as if his being there were purely accidental. So shy was he commonly of showing feeling, and when I opened the door he never rushed in like a cat, but loitered and lounged, as if he had no intention of going in, but would condescend to. And yet the fact was he knew dinner was ready, and he was bound to be there. He kept the run of dinner time. It happened sometimes during our absence in the summer that dinner would be early, and Calvin walking about the grounds missed it and came in late. But he never made a mistake the second day. There was one thing he never did. He never rushed through an open doorway. He never forgot his dignity. If he had asked to have the door open and was eager to go out, he always went deliberately. I can see him now, standing on the sill, looking about at the sky, as if he was thinking whether it were worth while to take an umbrella, until he was near having his tail shut in. His friendship was rather constant than demonstrative. When we returned from an absence of nearly two years, Calvin welcomed us with evident pleasure, but showed his satisfaction rather by tranquil happiness than by fuming about. He had the faculty of making us glad to get home. It was his constancy that was so attractive. He liked companionship, but he wouldn't be petted or fussed over, or sit in anyone's lap a moment. He always extricated himself from such familiarity with dignity and with no show of temper. If there was any petting to be done, however, he chose to do it. Often he would sit looking at me, and then moved by a delicate affection, come and pull at my coat and sleeve until he could touch my face with his nose, and then go away contented. He had a habit of coming to my study in the morning, sitting quietly by my side, or on the table for hours, watching the pen run over the paper, occasionally swinging his tail round for a blotter, and then going to sleep among the papers by the inkstand, or, more rarely, he would watch the writing from a perch on my shoulder. Writing always interested him, and until he understood it, he wanted to hold the pen. He always held himself in a kind of reserve with his friend, as if he had said, Let us respect our personality, and not make a mess of friendship. He saw, with Emerson, the risk of degrading it to trivial conveniency. Why insist on rash personal relations with your friend? Leave this touching and clawing. Yet I would not give an unfair notion of his aloofness, his fine sense of the sacredness of the me and the not me. And at the risk of not being believed, I will relate an incident which was often repeated. Calvin had the practice of passing a portion of the night in the contemplation of its beauties, and would come into our chamber over the roof of the conservatory, through the open window, summer and winter, and go to sleep on the foot of my bed. He would do this always exactly in this way. He never was content to stay in the chamber if we compelled him to go upstairs and through the door. He had the obstinacy of General Grant. But this is by the way. In the morning he performed his toilet and went down to breakfast with the rest of the family. Now when the mistress was absent from home, and at no other time, Calvin would come in the morning when the bell rang to the head of the bed, put up his feet and look into my face follow me about when I rose, assist at the dressing, and in many purring ways show his fondness, as if he had plainly said, I know that she has gone away, but I am here. Such was Calvin in rare moments. He had his limitations. Whatever passion he had for nature, he had no conception of art. There was sent to him once a fine and very expensive cat's head in bronze by Fremier. I placed it on the floor. He regarded it intently, approached it cautiously and crouchingly, touched it with his nose, perceived the fraud, turned away abruptly, and never would notice it afterward. On the whole, his life was not only a successful one, but a happy one. He never had but one fear, so far as I know. He had a mortal and a reasonable terror of plumbers. He would never stay in the house when they were here. No coaxing could quiet him. Of course, he didn't share our fear about their charges, but he must have had some dreadful experience with them in that portion of his life which is unknown to us. A plumber was to him the devil, and I have no doubt 
that in his scheme plumbers were foreordained to do him mischief. In speaking of his worth, it has never occurred to me to estimate Calvin by the worldly standard. I know that it is customary now, when one dies, to ask how much he was worth, and that no obituary in the newspapers is considered complete without such an estimate. The plumbers in our house were one day overheard to say that they say that she says that he says that he wouldn't take a hundred dollars for him. It is unnecessary to say that I never made such a remark, and that, so far as Calvin was concerned, there was no purchase in money. As I look back upon it, Calvin's life seems to me a fortunate one, for it was natural and unforced. He ate when he was hungry, slept when he was sleepy and enjoyed existence to the very tips of his toes and the end of his expressive and slow-moving tail. He delighted to roam about the garden and stroll among the trees, and to lie on the green grass and luxuriate in all the sweet influences of summer. You could never accuse him of idleness, and yet he knew the secret of repose. The poet who wrote so prettily of him that his little life was rounded with a sleep understated his felicity. It was rounded with a good many. His conscience never seemed to interfere with his slumbers. In fact, he had good habits and a contented mind. I can see him now walk in at the study door, sit down by my chair, bring his tail artistically about his feet, and look up at me with unspeakable happiness in his handsome face. I often thought that he felt the dumb limitation which denied him the power of language. But since he was denied speech, he scorned the inarticulate mouthings of the lower animals. The vulgar mewing and yowling of the cat species was beneath him. He sometimes uttered a sort of articulate and well-bred ejaculation when he wished to call attention to something that he considered remarkable, or to some want of his, but he never went whining about. He would sit for hours at a closed window when he desired to enter, without a murmur, and when it was opened, he never admitted that he had been impatient by bolting in. Though speech he had not, and the unpleasant kind of utterance given to his race he would not use, he had a mighty power of purr to express his measureless content with congenial society. There was in him a musical organ with stops of varied power and expression, upon which I have no doubt he could have performed Scarlatti's celebrated cat's fugue. Whether Calvin died of old age, or was carried off by one of the diseases incident to youth, it is impossible to say, for his departure was as quiet as his advent was mysterious. I only know that he appeared to us in this world in his perfect stature and beauty, and that after a time, like Lohengrin, he withdrew. In his illness there was nothing more to be regretted than in all his blameless life. I suppose there never was an illness that had more of dignity and sweetness and resignation in it. It came on gradually, in a kind of listlessness and want of appetite. An alarming symptom was his preference for the warmth of the furnace register to the lively sparkle of the open wood-fire. Whatever pain he suffered, he bore it in silence, and seemed only anxious not to obtrude his malady. We tempted him with the delicacies of the season, but it soon became impossible for him to eat, and for two weeks he ate or drank scarcely anything. Sometimes he made an effort to take something, but it was evident that he made the effort to please us. The neighbors, and I am convinced that the advice of neighbors is never good for anything, suggested catnip. He wouldn't even smell it. We had the attendance of an amateur practitioner of medicine whose real office was the cure of souls, but nothing touched his case. He took what was offered, but it was with the air of one to whom the time for pellets was passed. He sat or lay day after day almost motionless, never once making a display of those vulgar convulsions or contortions of pain which are so disagreeable to society. His favorite place was on the brightest spot of the Smyrna rug by the conservatory, where the sunlight fell, and he could hear the fountain play. If we went to him and exhibited our interest in his condition, he always purred in recognition of our sympathy. And when I spoke his name, he looked up with an expression that said, I understand it, old fellow, but it's no use. He was to all who came to visit him a model of calmness and patience in affliction. I was absent from home at the last, but heard by daily postal card of his failing condition, 
and never again saw him alive. One sunny morning he rose from his rug, went into the conservatory, he was very thin then, walked around it deliberately, looking at all the plants he knew, and then went to the bay window in the dining room, and stood a long time looking out upon the little field, now brown and sear, and toward the garden, where perhaps the happiest hours of his life had been spent. It was a last look. He turned and walked away, laid himself down upon the bright spot in the rug, and quietly died. It is not too much to say that a little shock went through the neighborhood when it was known that Calvin was dead. So marked was his individuality, and his friends, one after another, came in to see him. There was no sentimental nonsense about his obsequies, and it was felt that any parade would have been distasteful to him. John, who acted as undertaker, prepared a candle-box for him, and I believe assumed a professional decorum. But there may have been the usual levity underneath, for I heard that he remarked in the kitchen that it was the driest wake he ever attended. Everybody, however, felt a fondness for Calvin, and regarded him with a certain respect. Between him and Bertha there existed a great friendship, and she apprehended his nature. She used to say that sometimes she was afraid of him. He looked at her so intelligently. She was never certain that he was what he appeared to be. When I returned, they had laid Calvin on a table in an upper chamber by an open window. It was February. He reposed in a candle-box, lined about the edge with evergreen, and at his head stood a little wine-glass with flowers. He lay with his head tucked down in his arms, a favorite position of his before the fire, as if asleep in the comfort of his soft and exquisite fur. It was the involuntary exclamation of those who saw him, how natural he looks. As for myself, I said nothing. John buried him under the twin hawthorn trees, one white and the other pink, in a spot where Calvin was fond of lying and listening to the hum of summer insects and the twitter of birds. Perhaps I have failed to make appear the individuality of character that was so evident to those who knew him. At any rate, I have set down nothing concerning him but the literal truth. He was always a mystery. I did not know whence he came. I do not know whither he has gone. I would not weave one spray of falsehood in the wreath I lay upon his grave. End of Calvin Recording by Jadopi www.publicdomainaudiobooks.blogspot.com End of Lords of the Housetops Thirteen Cat Tales Edited by Carl Van Vechten